Hi, I'm Sheena Gill, and welcome to this episode of Early Detect Studios. Today, we are talking about sepsis. Sepsis is the cause of one in five deaths worldwide, and it disables millions more. In this context, it is our privilege to welcome Dr. Danielle Clark as our featured guest. Dr. Clark obtained her PhD from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and Epidemiology. She has dedicated the past 15 years and counting to public health capabilities and answering pressing questions aimed at improving clinical outcomes for patients in low resource settings. Dr. Clark co-founded the Austere Environments Consortium for Enhanced Sepsis Outcomes, a CASO program at the Henry Jackson Foundation. She currently serves as director, setting the research priorities, establishing strategic partnerships, and leading overall program implementation. Dr. Clark, welcome to Early Detect Studios. Thanks so much for having me. Dr. Clark, perhaps we can start with a question setting some sort of context for today's discussion. So sepsis is the leading cause of death in U.S. hospitals, and it's also the leading cause of readmissions to the hospital. So perhaps for our audience, why don't we just start with what is sepsis? Sure. So sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction due to a dysregulated post response to infection. A bit of a mouthful, um, but in other words, you have an infection, um, and that infection may start out localized, such as uh, a pneumonia or a urinary tract infection, or even an infected cut, for example, um, or it may just start out as an undifferentiated febrile illness. And then somewhere along the way, your body's normal response to that infection becomes abnormal and, and harmful. Understood. So can you explain to us um, why is it so deadly? More. Yeah, actually many reasons. <laughs> so first off, it can be very difficult to recognize. Um, people may not recognize that they actually need medical attention mm -hmm. and may present to the hospital late in the course of disease. Right. Um, or they may present early to the hospital um, only to be sent home um, and progress to more severe disease at home. Um, the second reason that I would point to um, is that there really are no FDA-approved treatments for sepsis, um, despite decades of clinical trials. Um, we could talk at length, probably, around reasons for that, um, but I think uh, one of the reasons that we often think about um, as a potential causative reason um, for that is that there's huge heterogeneity um, in the disease itself. So right. novel approaches really are urgently needed um, to better understand uh, what we think of as subtypes of sepsis, so if we can group people into um, types um, or subtypes um, by things like their host response profile, um, we may be able to better tailor clinical management strategies in a more targeted and, and hopefully more effective way. That makes sense. That absolutely makes sense. So um, from what you're describing, uh, could you share with our audience, you know, who's more at risk for sepsis? Yeah, so the important thing for everyone to understand is that really anyone can develop sepsis. Um, certainly, individuals who have a higher risk of infection, um, they certainly have a higher risk of sepsis. Um, so immunocompromised individuals, um, elderly, neonates, um, people in, in those types of categories that are more likely to get an infection um, in general um, are certainly at higher risk. But even young, previously healthy adults um, can also develop sepsis. Very interesting. So, you know, you were recently quoted as saying that, um, we are looking to identify strategies and develop tools that will work in austere settings, which could include hospitals in developing countries or public health emergencies such as a pandemic um, in the U.S., or in other countries where facilities are overwhelmed and resources are limited. By learning more about sepsis, we can better serve our military members, U.S. citizens, and populations around the globe. Uh, so this certainly uh, encapsulates your mission well. But why don't you tell us about your team's work today and where you are headed in the future? Well, so as you mentioned, um, our mission really is to improve survival for patients with severe infections in low-resource settings. So we do that um, a number of ways. Uh, we work on developing tools and strategies to guide clinical management decision-making. 
Our primary focus is on understanding these host response profiles that I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, and then trying to use that information on how your body is responding to the infection um, to guide the clinical management strategy. So to give you an example, say a person comes into the emergency department with a fever and an elevated heart rate. Uh, so we're working on developing a blood test that could be run in the emergency department to help decide if it's safe to give that patient some fluids and perhaps send them home, um, or if they're predicted to have a more severe clinical disease course and perhaps they need to be either watched for a longer period of time um, or perhaps even admitted. So we're also working on um, point of care tests um, that could be used to monitor patients over time to evaluate whether they're responding to a treatment or not. So um, the tools and strategies we're developing are certainly applicable um, to hospital settings globally. Um, but as you mentioned, they're also applicable in the setting of a pandemic right. where even hospitals in the developed world, um, you know, they, they suddenly don't have the resources to meet the need at hand. So we've done uh, extensive work uh, in Ebola and, and now COVID um, to help develop and evaluate tools that could also be used in, in that type of outbreak setting. Um, so sepsis um, certainly, but, but severe infections more broadly um, and developing tools and strategies that are applicable for those settings where you don't have enough resources to, to meet the need. Um, in terms of our future directions, um, we're focused on really rigorously evaluating the tools um, that we're developing and then getting them out into the world, really. Um, right. But we're also very interested in novel therapeutic approaches um, that modulate aspects of the host response. So, you know, we think that our efforts to understand subtypes of sepsis um, may help identify specific groups of patients that may respond well to targeted therapy. It's very interesting. Very interesting. So, you know, um, it seems evident that um, early detection is critical for sepsis in general, um, but it seems even more critical in austere environments. Um, you know, in fact, your website notes that those deployed in uh, austere environments where expensive diagnostic and treatment facilities aren't available, they're six times more likely to die of sepsis. Um, so can you please share with us how early detection um, improves sepsis outcomes? Yeah, so early detection is absolutely critical in sepsis. Um, delays in treatment have been shown to significantly impact survival. Um, mortality increases by as much as 8% for every hour treatment is delayed, which is tremendous when you think about it. Um, but recognizing sepsis is not as easy as you might think. Um, and there have been <laughs> right. huge campaigns to build awareness of sepsis, but that much more is certainly needed. Um, and in particular, in low resource settings, you know, the, the resources required um, for that early detection and, and prompt treatment um, really do contribute to the, the higher impact that we see internationally. Absolutely, absolutely. Early detection does seem to be a very critical piece to advancing um, and improving outcomes in sepsis. So, um, you know, as part of your work, you are aiming uh, to predict whether a patient will have um, a severe clinical course or um, you know, differentiate patients with a bacterial infection uh, from patients with a viral infection, if you will. So um, yeah, I would love to learn and understand from your perspective, um, how could AI and ML assist? And what is the role of data for the, the work that you do and for the work in the future? Absolutely. So we utilize highly complex data sets for pretty much everything we do. <laughs> the body's response to an infection involves a huge range of biologic systems and processes, and particularly in sepsis, um, those systems and processes may be acting abnormally. So we measure right. genes, genes, metabolites, clinical, clinical chemistries, hematology, and clinical signs and symptoms, um, and try to look for patterns in the data. Um, we look closely at the data from that initial presentation to the emergency department, um, but also right. longitudinally um, during the hospitalization and sometimes a year or more um, after that initial illness episode, um, wow. we're looking at uh, long-term sequelae uh, resulting from these severe infections. So we use a number of uh, different analytic approaches to visualize the patterns in the data. 
um, as well as building algorithms to classify subgroups or predict clinical outcomes. So I think these mm -hmm. complex data sets and advanced analytic approaches are absolutely essential to understanding sepsis and ultimately improving survival. That's really interesting. And it's it's one of our core areas of interest as well, as you know. Um, and I think that working together, um, you know, AI, ML, uh, the data, and all of the great work that you do is really going to make massive improvements in outcomes for, for sepsis. So Dr. Clark, I want to ask you a very important question. Why do you think sepsis doesn't get the attention it deserves? Good question. So I think there are a few reasons there. Um, one, historically, uh, there was a, a big push to try to develop therapeutic approaches for sepsis. Mm -hmm. Um, and unfortunately, um, many of those trials failed ultimately um, to identify um, products uh, for improving survival for sepsis. Um, and so I, I think that as a result of, of that, there was a, a little bit of a retraction away from um, sepsis research in general. I see. Um, and then also, I, I think uh, part of the problem historically has been around definitions. Um, you know, the, the definition of sepsis has changed and evolved uh, over time. Um, it's difficult to define um, because it is a, a syndrome. Um, and so and that causes some problems with, um, with epidemiology and, and, and tracking of, of cases. And so um, particularly internationally, um, you know, for example, if you have a severe infection, um, malaria, for example, um, and an individual dies from that infection, um, yes, they, they died from malaria, but um, it also is, is uh, likely, uh, in fact, that uh, they were also um, septic or could be considered um, dying of sepsis as well. And so I, I think that um, the difficulties there in, in really understanding understanding the true burden of disease um, certainly contributes to um, not having that uh, awareness around the disease itself. Um, but that's luckily that's changing. Um, there's certainly been um, renewed uh, interest um, and renewed efforts, I think, to um, build awareness to re revitalize the the research um, endeavors, um, both in understanding. The disease process itself, as well as um, some some new interest in developing again um, therapeutic approaches for the disease. Absolutely, and I'm I'm so glad that we are seeing this this changing trend. So another question I had for you, Dr. Clark, with all of the great work you and your team are doing, ten years from now, what impact would you like to see from all of your work? Sure. Um, ultimately, we would love to see the, the tools and strategies that we're developing actually in use um, and able mm -hmm. to uh, guide clinical management decision making. And so that's certainly one aspect of it. Um, I think also um, just from a, a basic biologic understanding of the disease and the disease process, and we'd really like to help inform that revolution really um, that we see right. needing to happen in terms of um, taking um, more targeted uh, approaches on the clinical management front. And so, um, you know, historically, if you look at uh, cancer, for example, um, historically cancer was treated as cancer, right? Everyone was sort of lumped together all in one bucket and largely treated the same. Um, and, uh, and now that's very different. Right now, exactly. now cancer treatment is, is very targeted um, and there are a number of uh, actual therapeutic products that have been developed um, for subtypes or subgroups of cancer patients. And, and we certainly hope that um, we can help with that push to move sepsis more in that direction to say, if we understand the disease process a bit better, if we can um, focus on identifying different subgroups or subtypes of uh, patients with sepsis, we can perhaps um, help uh, develop or, or inform at least uh, some novel therapeutic approaches that can make a difference with patient survival. Absolutely, that makes sense. And I'm sure from all the great work you're doing, we will see this impact. Thank you.
So, uh, Dr. Clark, it was a real honor to have you on our show today, and I hope that this very important session helps to spread awareness about sepsis and the great work that you and your team are doing. To our audience, thank you for watching, and we welcome you to join us on our next episode of Early Detect Studios. Until then, be well and take care.